Hello, welcome to Sigma Tech Learning Hall. I'll be your instructor for biology. For this class, we are going to be taking our exercises from the exam guide app. Now, if you don't already have this installed in your device, I would like you to download the app in order to follow along in this class. Now, exam guide is a leading educational app that helps students prepare adequately for various exams. Exams such as the UTME, the post-UTME, WIAC, GCE, IGMB, KCPE, JUPEB, Calbepedia. In the junior sections, we also have the BECE, we have the JSCE, and so much more. Now, you can download the app from www.examguide.com or you visit the Google Play Store to download. Now please subscribe to our channel and turn on the notification bell to update yourselves on new videos that will be coming up. Now if you're ready for this class, let's get started. Today we're going to be talking about classifications of living things. And if you could see on the screen, I said classifications of living things. One, this is because um, the topic classifications of living things is quite broad and we're going to be looking at it in several parts. So we're starting with the first one, which is classification of living things one. Now let's take a look at some of the objectives, things you should take note of, or things you should know at the end of this class. Now, number one, you should be able to define classifications of living things. You should be able to define it. Number two, you should be able to explain the binomial system of nomenclature. We're gonna to come to that and also give names of some organisms. Number three, you should be able to explain the unique nature of a virus, the unique nature of a virus. And number four, you should be able to mention some characteristics of several kingdoms, which include Kingdom Monera and Kingdom Protista. And you should be able to tell us some of their phyla with examples along with it. So if you're set, let's get started with this. Now, the first one we're looking at is definition of classifications of living things. As the name implies, to classify means to arrange or to put in a group or place in a group. So based on this, classifications of living things simply means um, uh, the arrangement or placement of living things into groups of certain common features, into groups with certain common features. Now, these common features helps us to distinguish between groups. Now, one of the main purposes for um, classification of living things is for easy identification. So, in other words, when we put living things into groups, we can easily identify them. Classification of living things is simply the placement or arrangement of living things into groups with certain common features. Now moving to the next is, um, there were several uh, thoughts among scientists and they were trying to see how to group or classify these living things. Because if you look at plants and animals, they are so huge. The, 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 the number of animals we have are so much the number of plants are so much. So many scientists or scientists were, happy, uh, were sort of like having it, finding it difficult rather, to um, classify these living things. And um, one man called Carolus Linus, Carolus Linus, he is a Swiss scientist and he came up with a system of classifying living things which is still used till today, which is still used to today. He, he came up with a classification of plants in 1753, and that of animals, he did that in 1758. He is a renowned scientist, and for that, we call him the father of taxonomy. That's the father of naming living organisms or classifying living organisms, because what he did actually helped a lot, and, and in fact, it simplified um, um, a way of identifying, easy identification of living things. Now, there were three um, ways he came up with this. We're going to be looking at three important parts of his work 
in terms of classifying these living things. Now, the first thing he did was to classify living things into seven major groups. He classified them into seven major groups. Now, these seven major groups, I decided to put them in acronyms, which we can simply remember as KP, COF, GS. KP, COF, GS. Now, each of these letters have a meaning. Now, the K stands for kingdom. K stands for kingdom. The P there stands for phylum. The P stands for phylum. C stands for class. C stands for class. O, order. F, family. G, genus. And S, species. Now, in terms of kingdom, uh, kingdom is like a large uh, um, group that houses a lot of um, organisms, both plants and animals. Now, these kingdoms can also be split or broken down into what we call phylum. Now, this phylum contains a large number of organisms. And also, this phylum is further broken down into class. The class is further splitted into order. The order is splitted into family. Family is splitted into genus. And genus is splitted into species. Now, I, I take much interest in species. Now, what is a species? Species are simply um, the smallest unit of classifications of living things. I repeat, species are the smallest unit of classification of living things. Now, in the species, you have a whole lot of organisms found in it. In fact, they have the highest number of organisms, <coughs> excuse me, highest number of organisms you can find within these seven groups. The species contains it more. Now, another important thing to take note of is this. Members of the same species can interbreed. Members of the same species can interbreed, but members of different species should not and cannot, should not interbreed. The reason is simple. If members of different species interbreed, they will not give rise to a fertile or a healthy offspring. An example can be given. For instance, um, let's say we, we belong to primates. We're going to be looking at um, the, the, the kingdom of, uh, sorry, uh, sorry, the um, taxonomy, if I will put it that way, or classifications of um, man. We're going to be looking at it. Now, man and other organisms belong to what we call the primate family, I think so. And in that particular family, in that particular family, uh, we have the, um, the chimpanzees, the gorillas, the apes, and all that. Now, we can't interbreed with them. If you interbreed with monkeys or apes, it simply means a healthy offspring is not resulted. You can't give rise to a healthy offspring or a fertile offspring. Are you getting what I'm saying? So one of the things, one of the disadvantage of interbreeding with members of different species is that they don't give rise to healthy offsprings or individuals. Please take note of that. Now, let's take a look at um, the taxonomy of man. Now, as you can see there on the screen, the classifications, we have kingdom, we have phylum for animals, division is for plants. We have class, we have order, we have family, we have genus and species. Now, for man, the kingdom is called kingdom animalia. Kingdom animalia. For their phylum, the phylum of man is called caudata. Caudata. The class of man is called uh, mammalia. Mammalia. The order is called a primate. The family is called hominidae. Hominidae. And then the genus is called homo and the species is called Homo sapiens. Let's take a look at that of a plant. Scientific classification of a maize plant, of a maize plant. The kingdom of a maize plant is plantae, kingdom plantae. 
The phylum is called Magnoliophyta. Magnoliophyta, that is, sorry, the division, not the phylum. We use divisions for plants. We use phylum for animals. The division is Magnoliophyta. The class is Liliopsida. Liliopsida. The order is Cipereals. Cipereals. The family is called Posiae. Posiae. And then the genus is called Z. And then the species is called Zemates. This is the scientific classification of maize plant. Carlos Linus also came up with a system of naming living organisms. The first thing he did, like I said, is classify them into um, seven major groups, which we have talked about. And then the second thing he did was to give them names. He gave names for, to all these organisms for easy identification. Now, these names are made up of, or each organism has two names in quote. The first name is called the generic name, the generic name. The second is called the specific name. Now the generic name is gotten from the genus name. Remember genus, when we're looking at the several major groups, is gotten from the genus name. And then the specific name is gotten from the species name, is gotten from the species name. Now please take note. When writing your, or writing a generic name, begin with a capital letter. When writing the generic name, please begin with a capital letter. Also, when writing the specific name, please also begin with a small letter. You can see that on the screen is highlighted in red. Please take note of this, it's a key thing. Now, let's take a look at some examples of living organisms their generic name and their specific name. Number one, man. You can see that the generic name is called Homo and the specific name is called Sapiens. Now, you could see also or notice that the generic name began with a capital letter and the specific name began with a small letter. Also, take a look at question, uh, sorry, number two, we have Lion. The generic name of a lion is called Panthera, Panthera, and then the specific name is called Leo. Hence, the name or the nomenclature of a lion is Panthera Leo. Number three is Rat. We have Ratus Ratus. Number four, we have the dog, which is called Canis Domestica. Number five, we have the housefly which is called Musca Domestica. Number six, we have the rice, which is a plant. It is called Oriza Sativa. Please take note of the capital letters in the generic name and the small letters that begins the specific name. Orange is called Citrus Sinensis, and then purple is called Carica Papaya. Now, moving to the next, the next thing that um, Carolus Linus did was to classify living things into kingdoms. Now, what he did initially was to classify living things into two kingdoms. He classified them into plant kingdom and then animal kingdom. But later, um, groups of scientists came together and reasoned within themselves. They discovered that there were some organisms that could not fit in properly into the plant kingdom as well as the animal kingdom. Hence, they now extended the kingdoms to accommodate other living organisms and extended it into five ma major kingdoms. And these five major kingdoms are called, number one is Kingdom Monera. Now, I'm going to mention or list them in their order of complexities. All right. Number one is Kingdom Monera, and it is far the simplest form of life or living organism, followed by Kingdom Protista. We have number three, Kingdom Fungi, number four, Kingdom Plantae, and then number five, what we call Kingdom Animalia. Now, we're going to be looking at an organism 
which we refer to as a virus. These are the different types of viruses we have. There are much more than this. We have the bacteriophage that feeds on bacteria. Yes. We have the adenovirus. We have the human immunodeficiency virus, which is the HIV, and so many other types of virus. We have the toga virus. We have the coronavirus. We have the picanoviruses, and so many others. Now, let's take a look at the unique nature of a virus. Virus is an organism. Please take note. Now, you can see there is a highlight on the screen. Virus does not fit into any of the five kingdoms. Now, please take note. All living organisms must fit into these five kingdoms. Any organism that does not fit into these five kingdoms in biology is not referred to as a living organism. Virus does not fit into any of these five kingdoms. So in other words, we can say that virus is a non-living organism. However, why do we say that virus is unique? Virus is a unique organism because virus exists as a living organism in some cases and also exist as a non-living organism in some cases. We can also say that virus stands at the borderline between living and non-living things. So you telling us, if you say that virus is a living thing, it means you're getting it all wrong. If you say virus is a non-living thing, you're getting it all wrong. Virus sometimes play the role of a living organism, or living organism rather, and sometimes it plays the role of a non-living organism. Now, how do we know that virus acts as a living organism? Now, virus can only act as a living organism when it is inside a living cell when it is inside a living cell. It shows several characteristics of living things when inside a living cell. Let's take a look at some of them. Characteristics of virus as a living thing or as living. Now, number one is that virus can reproduce when present in another living organism. Remember, characteristics of living things. One of the characteristics of living things is reproduction. So virus can reproduce. It means that virus can give rise to new individual after its own kind or of its own species. It can give rise by what we call binary fission, which is an accessual type of reproduction. Number two is that virus possess characters or traits which can be transmitted from parents to offsprings or which can be transmitted from one generation to another. It simply means that virus can copy its own traits and character into another organism of its own kind. And that is genetics. So virus undergoes what? Hereditary or genetics. Okay? So these are two characters or characteristics that helps us tell us or that tells us that virus is a living organism. Now, what are also the characteristics that shows that virus is a non-living organism? Please take note, when a virus is not in a living cell, it acts as a non-entity. It does not show any form of life in it. Now, look at number one. When outside a living cell, it is found as in a non-living or in a non-living medium, virus assumes a crystalline form and becomes a non-living thing. It does not move. It will not move. As far as it is in a non-living medium, virus does nothing. It can't move. It can't respond to stimulus. Look at number two. When outside a living host, virus does not respire. It doesn't respire. It doesn't excrete. It doesn't respond to stimulus. And that simply means these are characteristics of non-living things. Characteristics of non-living things. Non-living things don't respire. Non-living things don't respond to stimulus. Non-living things don't excrete. These are some of the characteristics that shows that virus is a non-living thing. Now, please take note of this. When a virus in, is in a living cell, it acts as a living thing. But when a virus is outside a living cell or a living medium, it acts as a non-living thing. Now, let's continue. 
uh, remember Carlos Linus came up with uh, five, uh, sorry, the groups of scientists came up with five major kingdoms. We're going to be taking two of them today. The first one is Kingdom Monera. Kingdom Monera. Now, Kingdom Monera, they show several characteristics. Number one is that they are unicellular and microscopic organisms. When we say something is unicellular, it means it is made up of just a single cell. And when we say it is microscopic, it cannot be seen with the naked eyes except with the aid of a microscope. So, Kingdom Monerans are so small and they are just made up of one cell. Number two, we say that they are prokaryotic. When we, what do we mean by prokaryotic? It simply means they do not have a definite nucleus. You don't see, so, uh, in, in, in their diagram or in their structure, you don't see a labeling called a nucleus. No, you can see contents of a nucleus which might include chromosomes, uh, like the DNA, RNA, and all that. That's what you're going to see inside of a Monera. It means they do not have a definite nucleus. And please take note, it is only Kingdom Monera out of the five kingdom that is regarded as a prokaryote. Kingdom Monera is the only prokaryote in the five kingdoms. Number three, they are the simplest form of living things. They are the simplest form of living things. Now, if you're looking at evolutional, evolutional trend, when, you, when you're moving from simple to complex, Kingdom Monera are the simplest. They are the simplest form of living things. Number four, they reproduce asexually by what we call binary fission. They reproduce asexually by binary fission. Now, take a look at the phyla of Kingdom Monera. We have one we call the first phyla, phyla of Kingdom Monera. is called the Cyanophyta. Cyanophyta. An example of a cyanophyta is a blue-green algae, which is also known as nostoc, blue-green algae. Number two phyla, number two phylum in Kingdom Monera is called the schizophyta. Schizophyta. An example of a schizophyta is the bacteria. On the screen, you can see a bacteria cell is just a cell. Now take a look at the structure of the bacteria cell. Remember, we talked about um, prokaryotes. If you look at the structure, look at the labelings, you will not see anything that is said a chromosome. But if you look at my, the cursor on the screen, you're going to see what they call chromosomal DNA. It is a content in the nucleus. So it simply means that bacteria is an example of a prokaryotic organism. An example of a prokaryotic organism. Next is Kingdom Protista. It can be called Kingdom Protista. Or you simply call it Kingdom Protista. Now let's look at some of the characteristics of Kingdom Protista. Number one, they are unicellular and microscopic organisms. Remember we've talked about this before. Unicellular, made up of one cell, microscopic, can't be seen with the naked eyes except with the aid of a microscope. Number two characteristics is that they are eukaryotic. Eukaryotic is actually the opposite of a prokaryotic. If prokaryotic organisms don't have definite nucleus, it simply means that eukaryotic organisms are organisms with definite what? Nucleus. You see the structure of the nucleus. Now, number three, they locomote. When we say locomote, it means that they can move the whole of their body from one place to another. They locomote either by, and there are several organelles used for this locomotion. They use the organelle called cilia. They use flagellum. They use what we also call pseudopodia. Now, cilia is used by paramecium, which is a protista. And flagellum is used by euglena and also chlamydomonas. Then we also have the pseudopodia used by an amoeba. Number four characteristics is that they reproduce both sexually, and we have two types of sexual reproduction, fertilization, and the second one which is called conjugation. 
So they reproduce both sexually and by conjugation and asexually by binary fission. Binary fission. Now, looking at the phyla in Protista, we have several phyla in Protista, but we're going to take just two of these phyla. The first one is called Protozoa. Protozoa. Another name for Protozoa simply means animal like protists. Animal like protists. Examples include the trypanosome, we have Amoeba, we have Paramecium, we have Plasmodium. Remember, Plasmodium causes malaria. We have the second one, which is called Euglenophyta. An example of a Euglenophyta is Euglena viridis. Euglena viridis. Before I come back to Euglenophyta, we can also add the third type of phyla, which is called the Protophyta. We have animal-like protist, protozoa. We have plant-like protist, which is called protophyta. An example is the chlamydomonas. We also have the chlorella. These are examples of plant-like protist. Now, why do we classify chlamydomonas as a plant or a plant-like protist? It's because of its cup-shaped chloroplast. Its cup-shaped chloroplast. And we're going to be looking at some of these cup-shaped chloroplasts. We're going to look at the structure of euglena. Now, take a look at amoeba. You can see that the nucleus is there. That is why we called it um, a eukaryote. It has a nucleus. The chromosomal DNA, like we saw in uh, monerans, is not visible. It is already embedded or inside the nucleus. Like we can see also the pseudopodia. Pseudopodia, which is used for movement in amoeba. The pseudopodia is used for movement. Take a look at that of paramecium. It has a nucleus, okay? It has hair-like structures, as you can see, which is called cilia for movement. Now, let's take a look at euglena. Okay, we have chlamydomonas. Take a look at the cup-shaped chloroplast I told you of. That is for chlamydomonas. Now, take a look at euglena. Euglena viridis. One special thing about euglena viridis is simply that it can show or carry out both plant and animal-like characteristics. It can carry out both plants and animal-like characteristics. Euglena is actually the only organism that can show this great feature. Now, what are some of the characteristics of euglena as an animal. Number one, euglena, they possess what we call flagellum. And this flagellum is used for locomotion. If you could remember, we said one difference between plants and animals is that animals locomote, plants do not locomote. So euglena can locomote. It can move from one place, move the whole of its body from one place to another. The second characteristics, animal character like characteristics of euglena is that they possess gullets for passage of food and as reservoir. Number three, they possess what we call contractile vacuoles. It is used for osmoregulation. Osmoregulation is a, is a way of regulating or creating a balance between the salt and water content of an organism. Then number four, is that they possess what we call eye spot. And this eye spot is for quick response to light. Remember also a difference between plants and animals. We said plants' response to changes in the environment is quick, but that of animal is very slow. Now, look at some of the plant-like characteristics of euglena. Now, euglena, they possess chloroplast. They possess chloroplast. And chloroplast is one of the conditions necessary for photosynthesis to occur in, 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 in plants, rather. One of the conditions necessary for photosynthesis to occur. The next one is they possess pyrenoid. They possess pyrenoid, which is for storage of starch. Storage of fat. No, sorry, storage of starch. So we're going to be looking at questions um, as regards this, we're looking at the exam guide. We're taking note of the exam guide. 
um, SSC questions, um, taking it from different past questions. Uh, let's get started with this and see if you pick some few questions. Now, look at question two. Which of the following organism is not a protozoa? We talked about amoeba. We talked about plasmodium, if you could remember. We also looked at paramecium. So the organism that is not a protozoa, which we did not mention, is called Ascaris. Ascaris is a worm, is a round worm. So it is not a protozoa. Next, look at the question, next question, question three. They said, which of the following groups embraces the rest? Which of the following groups embraces the rest? If you take a look at them, the correct answer is kingdom. Kingdom embraces the rest. Look at next question, question three or question four. They said, in which of the levels of classifications are the number most similar? Most similar. And that is in species. C. In species. Um, we have so many questions here. So many, so many. There are so many questions to be gotten from the exam guide that will really help you in preparing. Take a look at question 10. They said, in the binomial system of naming organism, the second name is called what? It is called the specific name. There is nothing like scientific name. There is nothing like common name. I told you we have just two names that uh, Carolus Linus gave, and that is the generic name and the specific name. The first one is called the generic name, and the second is called the specific name. Look at question... Look at this. They said, which of the following organism is not classified as an animal? It's not classified as an animal. The correct answer is Obelia. Sorry, the correct answer is Euglena. Euglena is neither an animal per se and is neither a plant. It carries out both activities, both functions. It functions as a plant and then it also functions as an animal. Thank you for participating in today's class. You can practice more questions using your exam guide app. The app scores and gives a detailed explanation of all the questions at the end of your practice test. You can also learn particular topics of interest with different modes, like study mode, uh, mock mode, and even practice mode. It, is also, it also has other features that makes learning very fun. Now, it is a must for all serious students. Download from www.examguide.com if you don't have it yet. See you in the next class. Don't forget to subscribe to our channels, hit the notific notification bell, and share the videos to your loved ones and friends that will benefit from it. Bye for now.